thanks a lot and, and warm welcome for those who stay to the very end. So thanks for that. If you've seen the presentation yesterday, you, you will know most of the things we'll talk about. And sadly, our uh, third presenter, Margaret, isn't here. So we'll get the intro about the beautiful landscape we aim to work in from an economist instead of from a Kenyan biologist, which is, of course, not comparable by any means. But I hope I'll still give a decent job. This last presentation, I assume it's somewhat different than a lot of the other presentations because we're not pitching any specific company, but it's more an attempt that together with Marco and Florian and my colleague Margaret, we're trying to develop pilot projects that show the abilities of the Nature Data Alliance that Marco was announcing yesterday. So in that sense, this is a pilot project with the aim to enable solutions and opportunities that can then be filled up by other startups, other companies that enable opportunities for others. The idea is that, well, the Data Alliance is a great concept, but like for any concepts, we need to show that it will work. And to do that, we want to turn to a concrete region, I mean, there will be more in the future, but that's one of the concrete regions we will turn to. Here, that's a region in, as you see on the map on the lower left, it's a region in uh, central Kenya. It's a beautiful place. I've last been there in, in, in spring. It's a semi-arid landscape, but there's also Mount Kenya. So you see, if you look at the map, it's a very diverse region. It's diverse when it comes to landscape, but it's also diverse when it comes to the actors in that landscape. There's a lot of wildlife, so you see a lot of the famous savanna animals, like elephants, for instance. You have pastoralist groups who have been living in that area for a very long time. You have private conservancies, you have public conservancies, you have tourism, you have environmental immigrants coming from Somalia and the north looking for jobs. You have industrial agriculture, especially closer to Mount Kenya, who are exporting, but you also have smallholder subsistence ag agriculture. It's also an area that's affected a lot by climate change. So we have increasing droughts in that area. We have a problem with water, and that has, of course, then uh, subsequent challenges because it means pastoralists need to increase the radius in which they're roaming. It means they are conflicting with the farmers. It means wildlife is looking for water. And of course, they're not respecting the boundaries of the farmers, which is also, increasing, uh, which is also leading to human wildlife conflict. So it's a beautiful region, but there are many challenges for like that human wildlife conflict, which is of course very sad because you can understand the motivation of the farmers, but you can also, of course, it's very sad to see that then the animals are suffering from this. So with that, I'll take over, I'll hand over to Florian and then you'll see me again towards the end. Um, yeah, in this picture, you see um, the different uh, uh, yeah, aspects of this ecosystem. So we have uh, savannas with bushes and trees. Uh, we have wildlife, um, as uh, Kai has told. We have forests and bushland, and we have wetlands, which are very important. And we have uh, humans, pastoralists, and small agriculture. And everything is link linked to each other and dependent. It's shown with these errors. So, for example, uh, the wildlife has impact on the forests, um, and the uh, pastoralists have impact on smallholder agriculture, but also on uh, the wildlife and the forest. So, there's a very complex uh, network of dependencies. And um, our goal is uh, to generate a digital twin of this uh, landscape in a resolution which is uh, not yet implemented on such a scale, 500,000 hectares, uh, the project site. <laughs> we will use a combination of satellites and data acquired by a solar-powered airplane um, which uh, can fly 30 days permanently over the area and deliver uh, data. And we will uh, put in the sensors on this airplane uh, to measure biomass, uh, land cover, and generate a three-dimensional representation of this uh, landscape. So in the middle, you see uh, the imagery, how it uh, will look like. So it has 20 centimeter resolution. It's much uh, sharper than conventional satellite imagery. 
uh, we will see uh, trees and even tiny bushes and a lot of spatial detail. Um, and uh, most importantly, we uh, will equip uh, the airplane with a LiDAR instrument, um, which delivers us a three-dimensional representation of the landscape. I don't know. Um, could you play the video, please? Just click on the video. So this is a forest uh, as seen uh, from above, uh, from an aerial image, and I hope the video will play. Otherwise, we skip it. No. Okay, um, from the image alone, it wouldn't be possible uh, to measure biomass, uh, and the LiDAR instrument is capable in scanning into the forest to, to, to generate a three-dimensional re representation of each single tree. And using technologies um, where we then correlate these measurements um, to uh, field measure trees, uh, we are able to determine the biomass of each tree and each uh, bush. Um, yeah, uh, our final goal is uh, to have an inventory of a complete inventory of the vegetation from the tiniest bush to the forest uh, in the upper uh, right um, and uh, to assess the biomass which is stored in this uh, vegetation, including the grasslands. And then uh, a new thing is also that we will be able to um, trace the uh, migration tracks of animals. So the wild animals uh, follow routes and uh, the rainfall pattern and available food, but also the pastoralists follow, follow similar tracks. And by analyzing uh, this complex net network, um, yeah, we will try to uh, understand what happens in the landscape to better manage the area. Then we will have also a monitoring, water monitoring system really to capture every small pond uh, in dry out rivers. Um, and even, even every water hole. And finally, um, we will monitor fire occurrence, the impact of fires on the vegetation uh, due to climate change and overgrazing. So the vegetation is de deteriorating, losing carbon, and by improved and adapted fire management like uh, prescribed burning, uh, we will try to increase uh, the carbon stock in the landscape and then finally generate uh, carbon credits which we will sell on the market and to give revenues to the local people. Back to you, Kai. Thank you so much, Florian. So, uh, this is quite impressive. I mean, we really see here there's a lot of progress and it's not just progress in terms of precision that we can see slightly more, we have a bit better resolution, but this is really enabling solutions that we couldn't even think of before. So our idea here is really to say, why do we look at this concrete landscape? What do we want to demonstrate? It's really, we want to say, for an existing land, a landscape, for an existing area, this will help us to discover potential carbon projects that we didn't even know of before. It will also allow us to assess much more precisely how much carbon can be stored where, which means local communities will get more money because they will be able to document more precisely how much carbon can be stored, sequestered with a specific project. So that better data is really an enabler that makes change possible. But of course, better data and monitoring <laughs> doesn't guarantee at all project success. It's, it's necessary, but by no means a sufficient condition. That's true here in Europe, but of course it's even more true if you go into a developing country context with weak state capacity, weak institutions, and just generally poor people with a short-term horizon. So what we aim to do, like, like me, my team, and generally as the Wies Academy and the University of Bern, first we want to provide really interdisciplinary expertise so really say, what do we know from different disciplines coming from the natural sciences, biology, climate change, regional climate predictions, but then also from a social science side, what do we know from behavioral economics, from psychology, from political science, how we can really, how we need to design those processes. So the risk of the process failing is minimized. Because we also know many investors, 
large or small, they really hesitate to engage in these areas where the political risk is high, where there's the potential for local conflict. So we know there are many reasons why a project might fail. We won't be able to get rid of all these reasons, but our aim is to minimize the risk of projects failing, which is currently a big reason why current carbon projects are not delivering or why they are delivering for a year or two and five years later the forest that was reforested has disappeared already. Together with that scientific expertise, the next really important crucial step is that we need to have deep engagement and local co-design so that with that pilot project we also want to demonstrate that we need to have a local team we need to rely on Kenyans in the Kenyan context. We need to make sure that projects are co-designed with communities, with politicians, to create solutions that are not designed by us Europeans for the Kenyans, but where we help and co-design so there's local ownership of those solutions. That means we need to bridge the gap between technology and people. This needs to happen at the individual level. So we need to check with individual like pastoralist communities, we need to tap into indigenous knowledge, see what are like traditional ways of working with the land that we might have forgotten. We also need to work with other local citizens to really make sure distributional conflict is minimized. So just to generally tap into the knowledge and minimize the risk that projects failed because we didn't account for local preferences. But of course, there's also politics. So our aim is to really implement participatory stakeholder processes, not just with the local citizens, but also with politicians at a regional level, at a national level, but also at the very small scale level with local mayors to tailor the solutions to the landscape and to the people. Finally, Yes, money matters. That's maybe why I'm here as well as an economist. So in the end, the whole idea behind these approaches and behind enabling these solutions is also to provide people in the regions with a secure livelihood. And that means with a secure income that is sufficient or that is a sufficient incentive for them to change their behavior. And that's really where the system is currently deeply flawed and failing. So for many current carbon projects, Red Plus and others, a tiny share of the revenues actually arrives to the local population. So some projects is less than 10%. <coughs> and of course, that is not sufficient. So we really need to use better technology, more affordable technology to channel a much larger share of the revenues to the local population. Second, it really, like the design of those payment streams matters. Currently, in most projects, people need to wait for a long time until even the first small payment arrives. So many projects, it's five years, sometimes eight, sometimes 10 years until you get your first payment. Now assume someone in your company or institution would tell you, you should drastically change your behavior in exchange for a promise of a potential payment in 10 years. How likely is it that you would do that? And how likely is it that you would comply with that? but we expect a poor Kenyan farmer or pastoralist to dramatically change their lifestyle for a promise by some Western organization or an anonymous carbon market. I mean, that, that's just, it's a crucial reason why projects are failing. Like there are now the first really reliable quantitative studies from randomized control trials showing that if we use upfront payments, we can increase project success by 10 to 20%. So if we pay out the same amount of money just instead of paying it after five years, we pay it initially, project success has increased dramatically. Second, we also need to ensure that payment streams are much more smooth over time. So a one-time payment might be nice for a local community, but in the end, this whole approach must be about creating long-term sustainable livelihoods, which means permanent incomes and jobs for the people on the ground. So we must smooth payment streams so they're really generally permanent ways of making a living for the people in that region. We also need, uh, or something that the data will enable us to do is to reward specific behavior. So for instance, we have a project in that region, it's called a buffer zone or a corridor project, where we try to see 
could farmers be rewarded or punished in a sense? So far, it's more punishment for providing corridors for the wildlife. But it's very hard to monitor and enforce that. With data that we will be able to collect, you can reward certain specific behavior with small or large micropayments if the behavior is in line with a project success or a specific agreement that was reached with the local communities. Finally, of course, I mean, we, Kenya is not, I mean, Kenya has many uh, well-educated people, but still we talk about an area that has pastoralists and small-scale farmers. So we need also to look at training, we need to look at consulting. Recent studies in Africa also show that once you, money alone doesn't do the trick. But if you combine money with training and consulting and services, and if it's designed in a fair and transparent way, that can really lead to a transformation, to a sustainable change. So that's the last point. We need to combine money monetary rewards also with consulting, with training, with other interventions. By doing this, what's the aim for us with this pilot project? Well, as I said, it's not a pitch for any specific company. It's really a pitch for enabling solutions for a whole ecosystem for a whole region. So we see this as a pilot project that will unlock the potential for many solutions, where we hope many of the solution providers will be members of the data lines. So it could be potential for sustainable agriculture, for agroforestry, for carbon projects, or so carbon projects are really not the only thing. Could be fire management, could be many different aspects. To do that, we gathered a core, or we designed a core project team with I, uh, Marco left again, of course, with Marco, me, Margaret, uh, and our local project partners in Kenya, and uh, Florian here, but also others like Skydweller to really represent this zero carbon footprint solar plane that will ensure the continuous data provision and the continuous monitoring. We have a cyber tracker with Lewis here present in the room, which will really be a means of integrating local people who can make a living by collecting further biodiversity data. We have Rainforest Alliance who will provide audio sensors. So that's a further means of really measuring biodiversity. And also, I mean, another co-benefit then trying to see combining that local data and the remote data, how can we better protect biodiversity and potentially also create an income out of that. But in the end, our idea is this is by no means a closed project. This should be an enabling project for the Nature Data Alliance. We're looking for people, of course, on the financing side. We're looking for further people who think they want to be active in that region and want to help us really develop that project and show that if we collaborate, better data and better processes will enable better processes for nature, but also for the local and indigenous people. So thanks a lot. So, thank you, Kai. <laughs>